Dear new social workers, my name is Megan Corredo. I'm an educator, a therapist, community organizer, theorist. I'm an author, an artist, a trauma survivor, the founder of the Stories Trauma Narrative Intervention, and I'm a social worker. I have my BSW, an MSS, and my DSW. For over a decade, I've provided support to traumatized individuals, families, groups, communities, systems. As I reflect on my years of practice as a social worker, there are several important lessons that I've learned. I'm sharing some of them with you today as you embark on your own professional journey as a social worker. Dear social workers, perfection is an illusion. I hate to disappoint you, but there's no such thing as a perfect social worker. There's no perfect advocate, perfect therapist, perfect community organizer, theorist, educator. They're just human beings doing the best that they can with what they have. I'm telling you now that you will not be perfect. You will mess up. You will make mistakes. Some of your mistakes will be small. Other mistakes will be big. Learn from them. And when you mess up, because you will mess up, show yourself the same compassion that you show your clients. Just as your clients are able to progress, grow, recover, learn, you can too. Remember that learning from your mistakes requires an attitude of openness, an acknowledgement of the fact that we are all works in progress. And with this attitude of openness, you can explore your strengths and your weaknesses. You can identify the gaps in your knowledge and skills. And after you've identified these gaps, you can come up with an action plan to facilitate your personal and professional growth. What important steps can you take as you strive not for perfection, but for a deeper understanding of social work practice, as imperfect as it may be? Find a good supervisor who not only focuses on your completion of tasks, but on your professional development. This means that you may have to pay for supervision outside of your organizational context. If this is difficult for you financially, think creatively. Identify a few like-minded people who you can bounce ideas off of. Create your own peer support group. Then find people who have a skill set that you don't and connect with them, watch them, learn from them. I knew that one of my weaknesses was navigating systemic politics. I'm a direct communicator and I learned the hard way that direct communication does not work effectively in every situation. I listened to and I watched colleagues who finessed their way through different situations that had the potential to be politically explosive and I learned from them. Watch and learn from other professionals. Feed off of their strengths and incorporate their strengths and strategies into your own social work practice. Next, change isn't always linear. As social workers, we advocate for change at every level, individual, group, community, systemic, cultural. Each of us has our own perspectives about how the change process should look. Remember that that change looks different for every individual. It looks different for every intervention, for every initiative. It looks different for every system. Sometimes change is a circle. Sometimes change is a line. Sometimes change is a roller coaster. Sometimes it's a sprint or a marathon. Sometimes we move backward before we can move forward. Sometimes when we finally move, the movement is painstakingly slow. Don't be discouraged. Change takes time and every individual, group, community, systems process is different. I wanna share a poem with you. It's comforted me in pivotal moments in my life when I question my own progress. It's called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters by Portia Nelson. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in, I'm lost, I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. It, is, it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. It's my fault. I know where I am. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down a different street. Dear new social workers, don't open up doors that you can't help people close. Many new social work graduates enter the field excited, excited to use the knowledge and skills that they've learned to assist and support, excited to put theoretical concepts into practice, excited to implement new interventions and strategies. 
preserve this excitement, remember this excitement, but also remember to be careful about the doors that you open in your work with clients. Sometimes in our excitement, we recklessly open doors, doors to pain, doors to adversity, doors to secrets and experiences that were hidden away for a reason. And we forget to help our clients close the doors again before they leave our offices and reintegrate back into the real world. This gives us a bad rap. This makes people scared to come to us. They think we'll disarm them, open them up, and forget to give them the tools that they need to close up the wounds so that they can successfully reintegrate back into their families, jobs, schools, and communities after they've left our offices. I want to encourage you to remember that helping clients open forbidden doors is only part of our task. We also have to help them shut the doors so that they can continue to survive in their current environments. I wanna share this graphic with you and I hope it's helpful for you as you think about your work with clients. So this graphic shows how we wanna begin our sessions, our interactions with people with lower impact topics. And then we wanna slowly but surely ascend the hill of emotional intensity to talk about the more distressing topics, whatever those might be for that particular concept. And we, we talk about these things within the window of tolerance. The window of tolerance is this amount of time, and it's never the whole session, where a person is able to tolerate talking about their pain and distress. And then before the session is over, we wanna descend back down the hill of emotional intensity with lower impact topics so that we're helping them kind of return back to equilibrium before we send them out into the world. It's really important to remember everyone's uh, window of tolerance is different. Um, and it's also important for us to remember um, that part of why, part of, part of responsible social work practice is not only supporting someone in opening the window and opening the doors, but also in closing them back again so that they can survive in their current context. Next, dear new social workers, use accessible language. You've learned a lot of fancy words and terminology, terms like countertransference, reliability and validity, the diathesis stress model, psychometric properties, ecological systems theory, um, the trans theoretical model of change. Be proud of your expanded vocabulary and your enhanced understanding of theoretical concepts, but also know where and when to use these terms. As new social work graduates, you may be tempted to use these terms in treatment team meetings, initial client encounters, your own family cookouts. Be judicious about where and when you use them. Sometimes we use these fancy words to prove ourselves, to show what we know. I think it's because as social workers, we often find ourselves fighting for respect, for a voice, for a seat at the table. We're often in host settings where people don't always understand what we do. We want to prove that we are more than just kind-hearted, empathetic helpers. There's a craft and a skill involved with what we do, but our use of fancy words and terms comes at a cost. The cost of our client's understanding, the cost of connection, the cost of clarity. Be proud of your degree and the terms and concepts you learned in your journey to pursue it, but never forget about the importance of connection and how language can connect or alienate. See, as social workers, we have to be conversant in multiple languages. In a single day, you'll be called upon to assess and diagnose, advocate, supervise, support, empathize. And each task you engage in may require you to understand and use a different language. Sometimes our language will be professional and proper. Other times it will be casual and conversational. We have to understand the language of diagnosis, managed care, community organizing, research, academia, slang. And then we have to learn all the different acronyms, the acronyms and abbreviations that are specific to our uh, particular setting. This requires us to identify the appropriate language to use at the appropriate time, in the appropriate context, with the appropriate people, so that we can connect and not alienate, join with instead of against, collaborate and not oppress. Dear new social workers, some of the most powerful interventions don't require words. In our educational programs, we learn about theories, interventions, strategies. We learn about narrative theory, CBT, object relations, gestalt, psychodrama, motivational interviewing. You will find yourself using all of these at given points in time in your professional career. But there will be times when you find yourself pushing these academic interventions to the side to meet the person where they are. At various points in your practice, you'll find yourself sitting in silence, playing a game of Uno, listening to music, dribbling a basketball, 
laying out an array of art supplies and watching your clients create. In these moments, you will wonder if you are doing enough, if these silent interventions without fancy names or acronyms are enough. They are. Our clients have endured pain that has cut so deep that there are no words to describe what they've been through. They've experienced rejection and their basic sense of safety has been shattered. Sometimes they're looking for an intervention that has survived the scrutiny of IRBs and randomized controlled trials. And other times they're looking for consistency, safety, respect. In the silent moments you share with clients when you're not using one of the interventions you learned about in social work school, in the silent moments when you are wondering whether or not what you are doing is enough, it is. In the silent, non-curated moments when we feel we're not doing anything, we may actually be doing everything. Take self-care seriously. Have you ever worked with a social worker or another helping professional who has a horrible attitude? I know you have, we all have. When you see this and you silently pass judgment on this colleague because of their cynicism, I want you to check yourself because one day this could be you. Most people do not enter the helping profession callous and abrasive. Most people enter the profession as you will enter the profession. Optimistic, motivated, energetic, enthusiastic, and then after years of exposure to systemic failure, shattered hopes, ridiculously large caseloads, and secondary trauma, they slowly but surely devolve into a state of self-preservation, protecting themselves by putting up walls of hopelessness and skepticism. When you encounter these colleagues, remember the importance of self-care. Self-care is not about bubble baths and trips to the nail salon. Self-care is about preserving your identity by intentionally incorporating reflective, rejuvenating, and expressive practices into your daily life so that you don't lose your drive, your empathy, yourself, as you provide support and assistance to other people. Self-care involves body awareness, controlling your own mental imagery, self-understanding, self-talk, creative play, supervision and peer support. It involves careful attention to the setup of your physical workspace, the implementation of boundaries. If you do not do these things, there are consequences. These consequences are physiological, behavioral, psychological, spiritual, and clinical. And if you ever need a reminder about what will happen if you don't engage in self-care, take a few minutes to read one of my favorite children's books by Dr. Seuss, and it's called Fidwick the Big-Hearted Moose. So this book is about a moose who invites animals to come live in his antlers. He says yes to everyone and everything. Before he knows it, things get out of control. He finds himself in a dangerous situation, and he has to learn the hard way how important it is for us to take care of ourselves. Self-care is not a joke. Dear new social workers, join with other helpers, not against them. You now have a unique skill set. This skill set will support you as you navigate a variety of different systems and provide support to a wide range of client populations. In the course of your work as a helper, you will encounter other individuals, teachers, grassroots organizers, mentors, coaches, invested family members. These individuals will probably not have a social work degree, but their expertise will be invaluable. Work with these helpers, not against them. Remember that although social workers represent a professional group of helpers, we are not the only helpers. And some people will never step into our offices. They will never seek out our services. Or if they do, they may be hesitant to talk to us because of their preconceived notions about who we are and what we do. But they will go to a teacher, a coach, a mentor. As social workers, we are proud of our profession, but we must also remember to respect other individuals as they provide unique forms of support to individuals and communities. We are not the only ones who can support and assist people in distress. And truth be told, there are not enough social workers in the world to do what needs to be done to support traumatized, marginalized communities. There is plenty of pain and adversity to go around. We are not the only helpers. Show respect to all helpers even those who are not social workers. Winnicott, one of my favorite theorists and founders of object relations theory speaks to this. So Winnicott provided support to youth who'd been evacuated from London to the countryside during World War II. Many of these youth were placed in hostels and residential treatment facilities or institutions. 
Winnicott said, quote, rather quickly, I learned that the therapy was being done in the institution by the walls and the roof. The therapy was being done by the cook, by the regularity of the arrival of food on the table, by the warm enough and perhaps warmly colored bedspreads. So I want to take the liberty of updating and expanding what Winnicott said. Therapy is not confi confined to the four walls of an outpatient mental health clinic. It's not restricted to the services of social workers, counselors, or licensed clinicians. Therapy takes place on the basketball court and the football field, at dance practice and art class, in community centers, churches and temples and mosques, on the laps of grandparents, aunties and uncles. Therapy takes place wherever there is safety, consistency, connection and acceptance. Dear new social workers, everything is not for everyone. So your social work degree affords you the opportunity to work with a wide range of systems and client populations. It allows you to work in schools, hospitals, homes, community centers, prisons, courthouses, outpatient facilities, residential treatment centers, with infants, with children, teenagers, young adults, with older adults, with people experiencing complex trauma, homelessness, domestic violence, mental illness, medical challenges. As you navigate through these systems to find your way as a social worker, you will find yourself excited and empowered in your work with particular client systems and populations. You'll also find yourself feeling frustrated and disconnected in your work with others. In these moments, it's important for you to engage in self-reflection. Figure out whether or not your responses are the result of implicit bias or if you need additional education about the population or setting in which you're working. Consider whether or not you need to do your own internal work on a particular issue. And then, after engaging in this reflection, remind yourself that everything is not for everyone. It takes some time to identify which systems and populations bring out your own strengths. And when you find a job that doesn't feel like it's a good fit, don't shame yourself because everything is not for everyone. Every system is not for everyone. Every client isn't for every clinician. Every cl clinician is not for every client. Every intervention is not for every population. Every supervisor is not for every employee. Everything is not for everyone. Dear new social workers, don't be afraid to burn bridges if you have to, but don't burn them unless you have to. Social work education trains you to be critical thinkers, powerful advocates, fearless trailblazers, Social workers are passionate, evocative, innovative. These are strengths inherent in our profession. It's important for us to remember that in the course of our work, we may have to burn some bridges, but we should only burn bridges if we have to. The helping profession is small, smaller than you think. If and when you choose to burn a bridge, also consider the potential implications of the bridges that you have burned. Burning a bridge is a bold and permanent decision that can have implications that could affect you for the rest of your social work career. Burning a bridge may also leave you voiceless and ostracized. And if you are voiceless and ostracized, so are the individuals and the communities that you represent. Strategically advocate. Think about innovative ways to address barriers. Creatively approach challenges. Consult with other social workers about alternative advocacy efforts. And if all else fails and bridge burning is the only viable option, don't be afraid to do it. In some circumstances, this may be the only choice you have left. Just be careful not to do it prematurely. For every story of trauma, there is also a story of strength. You will hear a lot of stories. You will hear stories of adversity, stories of terror, stories of deprivation and neglect, stories of betrayal, stories of loss. These stories will change you. But remember that for every story of trauma, there is also a story of strength. For every story of someone falling down, there's a story of someone getting back up again. For every story of destruction, there's also a story of creativity. For every story of adversity, there's a story of resilience. For every story of defeat, there's a story of empowerment. As you support clients and systems through their most trying, overwhelming, and traumatic experiences, remember to always look for the strength. This won't be easy, and you have to train your eyes, adjust your vision, but over time, this will come naturally to you, and you will see the strength everywhere you look. You will see the destruction too, the trauma and the pain, but this will be offset, balanced by the strength and resilience that you see in every individual, family, group, community system. For every story of trauma, there are stories of strength and resilience. Dear new social workers, 
you are the change. At various points in your career, you will notice problems, big problems, and you will wonder how the problems got to be so big. You will look around at colleagues and supervisors to see if they see what you see. You'll look to your agencies, administrators, and policymakers for solutions. You will wait and you will wonder if anything will get better and if anything will change. And if so, who will make the changes happen? In these moments, I want you to remember that you are the change. You are the spark. And you can hope and wait for someone else to come along for, our, for however many weeks, months, years it may take. Or you can look in the mirror, reflect on your own skill set, experiences, insights, and you can enact the change yourself. I want to share a story with you, a children's book that I wrote, and it's called You Are the Vision. Vision is electric color in a world of gray, illuminating alley streets and lighting up the way. Vision is the eyes to look beyond the now, create a future path that stretches past the why and how. Vision is the lens, allowing us to view a world beyond the present, see a future hopeful, new. Vision is the shoes that lead us down a street, beyond the chain link fence, past adversity, defeat. Vision is to walk where no one dares to go, the strength to keep on moving through the rain and sleet and snow. Vision is to know through fog and dust and smoke that when you make it to the end, you'll find the light, the hope. Vision is a mirror that dazzles, shines, reflects, the passion and the purpose, the plan for what comes next. Vision is the children who find the strength to fight against the voices saying that their dreams are out of sight. Vision is you. You are the vision. I welcome you to the social work profession. I'm excited and inspired by your enthusiasm, your motivation, your scholarship. I can't wait to see how you will change the world. In closing, I wanna share this poem with you and it was written by Langston Hughes. It's called Dreams. Hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen with snow. Hold on to your optimism, your passion, your drive. Welcome to social work. <laughs>